Welcome back to another episode of Suds and Cinema. My name's Kyle. I'm Jacob. I'm Josh. This is episode number 47, and tonight we are going to be reviewing Let Them All Talk, the new Steven Soderbergh film, released on HBO Max, an HBO Max original. Plus some uh, other stuff we've been watching. It's probably going to be a very short episode, and full uh, disclosure, this is another remote recording podcast, but I'm not doing this at home. I'm in uh, Florida currently, so on COVID a different capital of the world. On a different <laughs> setup. Yep. COVID capital. Now that he's testing I mean, out that new immunity he got. Yeah, he's good. <clears throat> yeah, testing out my antibodies, putting them uh putting them some under some stress. So yeah, just wanted to uh throw that out there that it might be a little bit shorter. Not sure how the setup is going to go, but uh we're gonna keep churning out content no matter what. Show must go on. So yeah. So also, we want to get right into this, um, so I can get back to the fam. And uh, we are actually going to do two beers today because it was my pick. Um, I've effed up and got a pilsner, and I'm in Florida, and Michigan is currently out of pilsner season. <laughs> yeah. But I also got a backup, uh, which was a local Florida brew. So this is brewed in. Uh, Tampa Bay, and we're going to do two beers because this is only in Florida, and so Jacob and Josh also got a beer. Yeesh. So do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so I got Unholy. Uh, this is brewed by Copper Tail Brewing Company out of Tampa, Florida, like I already said. This is a, uh, well, it's a Belgian triple, but it's actually an American triple ale because... It was not made in Belgium, but it is, I expect it to be very similar to a Belgian triple uh, with a little twist. Uh, so I'll just read the description here. It says, our take on the triple style originally brewed by monks in Belgium features fruity slash funky notes from the traditional Belgian yeast paired with a sacrilegious American hop character. Ooh. So that's where I expect it to be a little different. Now, about Copper Tail Brewing, Josh has actually been there. Yes, so a little segue into that. I did go to Copper Tail. Um, very, very cool place. Um, it's like, obviously, you from the name, you kind of get the um, the um, pirate feel from it. And they also, in Tampa, if you didn't know, there's a huge festival where, like, they have all these big old school boats come in and, like, on this channel. So, like... Everyone dresses like pirate themed. And oh, you mean like sh- like whole ships? Yeah, like actual ships. Okay. And it's by the city. It's actually a place called Ebor City, which is I don't know. If, I'm pretty sure that Copper Tail was technically an Ebor City, which is like a city inside of Tampa. I might be mistaken, but I went to a lot of different breweries. But yeah, I went there. Really, really cool spot. Awesome food. Um, if you're in the Tampa area, and their beer is really good, Kyle. So you should be pleased. Um, so if you're in the Tampa area, I would definitely recommend checking it out after you check out angry chair cause it's better, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So you have not had this, uh, beer though, specifically unholy. I don't believe so. Of course I could have not checked it in, but I, I know I'm pretty sure I had a flight there and I only checked in two beers. So, um, okay. I might have had I it, but I doubt it because I, I wouldn't have gravitated towards a Belgian triple. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, cool. We'll go ahead and introduce yours and then we'll do the usual crack them all at once. Yeah, so Kyle went with a Florida beer, so he's in Florida, so I figured we'd go with a Michigan beer, um, and I went with Perrin Brewing, which I, I'm i 99% sure we haven't featured them yet, but I could be And they're, they're pretty big here. They're, yep, yep, they're big. They're out of Grand Rapids, so, um, and this is part of their Side Hustle series. I haven't heard of it, but um, I'm assuming it's like an experimental series since the side hustle angle but we got a porter and i wanted to go with uh seasonal since this is the last episode before christmas so it is a mint porter so there's that yeah do you want to go into more of your details kyle did you go like abv and all that or description uh actually i didn't yet uh good call uh so this has an abv of 9.2 percent uh, so yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, I guess it's a triple though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a Belgian triple. Yeah. Uh, 
as expected. Um, it uh, no IBUs are available on Untapped. Um, I read the description. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really not much, not much else details. Like I said, it's it's from Tampa. Uh, there's a twist, an American twist on it. Um, oh, I guess, I guess I'll be able to give there, you more yeah. details when I try it. So, it's it is 100% brewed and canned at the brewery, though. Uh, you know, they don't outsource any things, though. I think it's a pretty big brewery by what by that uh, description. I mean, you've been there. You would know. It's a big building. I don't know in terms of production how much they do, but it is like a two, two-story two building. Mm-hmm. So, probably. They I saw a couple. <clears throat> this I got this one because I love Belgians, as you guys know. Um, but they do have uh, pretty cool art on all their for mm-hmm. all their cans and designs. It reminded me of um, like the some of the scenes from Flapjack. Like oh, that really? kind of art. Oh. Okay. Yeah. What's his? What's that guy's name? I forget. The the I guy that created name. it. Not by Penal- Ward. Not top Pendleton of Ward. Nowhere. Isn't it the one? He, didn't he do that? The guy who did Adventure Time. What's his name? Like Pendleton, Pendleton, Ward. Pendleton Ward. Ward. He did yeah. some episodes, but he wasn't the creator. Yeah. But yes. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so go ahead and list off your details, and then we'll drink this. Mine just says uh, with notes of smooth chocolate and refreshing mint. This porter is perfect for the cold weather mid, m- mint night snack you've been craving. We got a 5.8 ABV porter. Um, IBUs weren't aren't really a, don't care. So yeah, let's cool. go for it. Let's drink it. Ready? Yep. Yep. That was pretty good. That's pretty in sync. <laughs> yeah. Two thousand miles away, and we still got it. A lot oh, of you know like that. mint on the nose there. It smells like mint chocolate ice cream. Trying to get on that on that twin sympath level. Yeah, um, it's mild mint, and I like that. Really, I think. Wait. I mean, I feel like it could be a lot more in your face. Yeah, it's good. I love mint and chocolate together. Me too. <laughs> so, like. Yeah, you can't really go wrong with that for me, but I'm guessing they this is probably pretty dark. It looks pretty dark. And with the chocolate in it, I'm assuming it's real dark. It does have a pretty uh bitter like aftertaste that like lingers there. Yeah. Yeah, we can see that. Bitter like coffee. Yeah, not unpleasantly. So, but I lo- love bitter things, so that doesn't mean a lot either it's oh, good how's that beer over right. there cool oh so it is i don't want to black. sound i don't want to sound um i don't want to just recite the description but it is it's very very spot on it is tastes just like a belgian triple but it is hoppier than like any belgian i've had so have you ever tried the triple from new belgium I think um, you I actually think I have. I'm wondering how it compares to that because I feel like that's more closely related to the more traditional way of making it without that hop character. Yeah, I've had triple from New Belgium. Yep, and no, this is this definitely is hoppier than that. Like I feel like this is like like they said, and uh, they said a sacrilegious amount of hops to it. Like it just doesn't have that same sweet yeah i was gonna say does it cut into that a lot it does it but it's a good blend like it's not like ipa hoppy obviously but it's not as sweet as a belgian like it's almost like a new it's just like a new style that's like super interesting now i wish i could try it well jacob it won't be soon but i am going to bring the reserve cans that i don't drink my parents are going to bring them back up so I will save some for you. Hell yeah. Can't wait to try it. Yeah. But um, I think it is very good. I love Belgians. I love IPAs. I think this is just like a perfect middle ground. Yeah. I also love those two. Very good. Okay. Um, uh, Are we ready to get into our featured review? We are. Beautiful. Let me pull it up. Oh, well, no, I don't want to do any news. We'll save it for next week. But real quick before I start this, did you guys see Charlotte Buff is getting canceled? What? 
Shia LaBeouf is canceled. What did he do with, this time? Uh, abuse, uh, FKA Twigs or whatever her name is, with because they dated. Yeah, a bunch of allegations of like just abuse and stuff. Really? Not good. Yeah. Well, that's shitty. Yeah, I know. It's sad. Because I'm looking forward to his new movie too. Yeah. What a dummy. Okay. Okay, so we are talking, haha, talking about Let Them All Talk. Get it? <laughs> uh, this is Steven Soderbergh's new movie. So it is directed by Steven Soderbergh. It is written by Deborah Eisenberg. Uh, it stars Meryl Streep, Gemma Chan, Diane Wiest, Candace Bergen, uh, and Lucas Hedges. Uh, plot synopsis reads, a famous author goes on a cruise trip with her friends and nephew in an effort to find fun and happiness while she comes to terms with her troubled past. Let's take a listen to a clip. Alice has a manuscript that's due really soon. Everyone at the agency is getting a bit nervous. I mean, I haven't seen a manuscript. H- have you seen the manuscript? I have not seen a manuscript. For years now, she's been hinting that she's revisiting one of her characters, so I've booked her on the Queen Mary 2 with her two friends and her nephew. Here's to picking up the conversation where we left off. And here's to reconnecting the gang of three who we used to be. (laughs) Did you always talk like that? All right, so what did you guys think of Let Them All Talk? So for me, it actually started pretty strong, honestly. I liked where it was going. I thought the acting was, that was pretty strong, like from beginning to end. The writing was witty and everything was fast moving and back and forth. And then once they got to the place that the rest of, you know, the ship, I guess, where everything else takes place, the pacing just took like a huge dive for me. I started not understanding what the movie was even about, really. And the message that I was trying to push across felt kind of, I don't know, weak, like juvenile, almost like... It yeah it, it for me it started strong and just kind of kept shooting itself in the foot and getting worse and worse throughout. Like it was shot well, it looked good, the acting was good, the writing was good, but then ultimately the plot and this that story was just so boring and the pacing was so slow and it was so repetitive that ultimately it could have ended up worse for me. But just because of the strength of everything else, kind of put it where i landed on it yeah i felt the same way the length was uh was definitely felt through most of this oh, movie i checked the <laughs> i kept pausing i'm like how much longer is this yeah i stopped it <laughs> once to go never pee and it was thing. like 40 minutes and then it never really like picked up after that yeah. i mean not to say that it was like necessarily bad but it could have been trimmed a lot a lot of the scenes could have been that were duplicated could have been taken out for sure but um i think the acting was really good and i also read that um steven soderbergh actually just used a skeleton script and a lot of this was improv i did see something about that you can tell i'll point something out or i have a note about it yeah a lot of it which at some times you could definitely I think it helped it a lot because it made it seem natural, not na- very natural. But yeah. other times it just kind of hurt the st- overall structure of some of the, some of the exact. Um, well, that's conversational the thing with pieces. Everyday conversation, right? You kind of delve off, you know, you go off topic, you digress, and everything, and that really hurt the, like the. It almost felt like nothing was going on sometimes. Like, what is the focus here exactly? Mm-hmm. There was no focus. It just kind of veered off, just like conversation would, and that did make it feel natural. But then it's like, what is this really about? Then I mean, you could—it's borderline plotless. Yeah, I would say that's what it felt like. At least felt like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I felt very similarly, except, um, I didn't love the beginning. Actually, I liked it better when they got to the ship. I kind of felt like there was. They had come together, and I think the beginning, those scenes were so separate, and they all of them felt very expositiony. Like yeah. we need to introduce these characters. 
oh, you don't know who my aunt is? This is my aunt. This is how we're related, if you didn't know. You yeah. Know, things like that. I see that. And, um, like, every character was had lines like that because we were thrown into this situation where we need to get them on the ship quickly, but you also need to know who they are. Right? Right. So the whole the whole setup just kind of felt clunky to me. I was I liked it better when they were on the ship. And then that's when the movie it's a classic example of a lot of every uh separate element is really strong or pretty strong, but as a whole as a film, like it just totally didn't work. Yeah. Um like I thought the acting was good. Uh some of the writing worked uh like each individual scene some of the like some of the dialogue and some of the things that they were saying, you know, was interesting, but the way it connects just the through line, I was with you. I was like, what is the point? What's the message here? Um it didn't really work as like even as like this story it was supposed to be like kind of like redeeming friendship almost, you know, and like it didn't even end that way, which Yeah, it wasn't it like that. It can be good to all. subvert Yeah, it can be good to subvert expectations, but it just was like kind of <laughs> dour at the end yeah i, was like, I felt so empty afterwards i'm like what was i supposed to get from this now <laughs> yeah I you know. never you never feel anything in this movie like there's no like when the big big thing happens nothing like there's no emotion whatsoever shown like yeah. there, and it's the same like the other the other uh plot line you could say there's two plot lines the other plot line is the same what is the same thing right they just it just kind of ends and like yeah sometimes that's what happens in life but it isn't interesting to watch in a movie <laughs> yeah exactly so i don't know and then as far as like the realism thing or like the skeleton script goes i literally wrote that down there's a fine balance between like realism and like a movie or a film right like there were some things that just felt like they were like a fly on the wall and like it was super super real like the scene where she goes into the back um, to not the part that's to the crew part of the ship. Right. And she's mm. like, Oh, you're not supposed to be here. This is for the crew members. And she gets turned around. Like that's something that <laughs> could have been cut from the movie. It adds realism, but it also adds time. And we were all, we, I think we all agree that the pacing was pretty bad. Bad. And yeah. then what, I mean, what did came of that? You know, exactly like, nothing. And then even after she add... leaves, it's there's nothing after that. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying is like there's like these little touches of realism, but they just also add length and almost like a I don't want to say boring, like, but it is. Kind yeah, of boring. it was boring <laughs> that those parts. Were, yeah, I was dipping into boredom multiple times. I didn't. Yeah. Like there was a lot of boredom, but it, I didn't hate. No, I didn't. Some Overall, of the boredom, like I would say I enjoyed it, but just that was mostly just from like the technical aspects of it like they were pleasing and it was i liked the chemistry that i kind of felt but once it tried to get into that weird darker story thing and whatever the ending was like that's when it really when i stopped seeing where the heck it was going or found out that it wasn't going anywhere basically i figured that out then i'm like okay there's like 40 minutes left but clearly nothing more is going to happen so like it just dragged. Yeah. I just think the 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 part where you settle in at was too late into the movie. So like you never really like settled in and like got the the what was happening in the movie or like the, the entire environment. You didn't really settle in until like the 40 yeah to an hour mark and then after that you're like okay, now I'm finally settled in. You already have fatigue from watching the first 40 to an hour that didn't really do much. Then you're on the boat and that's super monotonous. And then it ends, and like the ending, the final act is, or whatever, is like 10 minutes. Yeah. And I like coming back on the beginning, I liked it because it was like, it was stylized, right? So I felt like the names popped up. Like it's introducing, I'm like, okay, let's see where they're going to have all these big, like, points or purposes for this plot. But then it kind of totally changed tones and it seemed like that was kind of, then it made that beginning part kind of pointless. And that's now that's when I can like agree. Yeah. It was not good when you compare it to how it ended up, but from where I was seeing it was going, I thought it was going to be much better. Yeah. I think, I just think that, um, 
Soderbergh can elevate his material because this is a guy that almost never writes uh, the movies that he directs. He pretty much purely mm-hmm. directs, and he almost always works with different writers too. So he's he's kind of interesting in that aspect because he can do a lot. He has a huge range, um, and most of his stuff actually is. I mean, we think of him as a you know he he is a pretty stylized director, pretty well, pretty critically acclaimed. But a lot of his movies, if you look at uh, every movie that's not really like a big hit, like an Oceans or something or Logan Lucky, if you look at all the middle, all the mid tier movies, most of those get like middle to kind of lower reception. And I think this definitely falls into that that tier. Yeah, this isn't going to be something that blows up and a bunch of people are watching. No, definitely not. No. Um. As far as the good goes, um, like I said, I think the acting is pretty good for the most part. Um, you know, obviously Meryl Streep is pretty good. But what did you think of Lucas Hedges? Because as far as performances go, when we were talking about the realism, he would add like these, like after questions or after statements or whatever sentences, he would be like, mm-hmm. And like, you know, those like um, just weird uh, uh, affects that he would add on and, it felt natural, but his was like the most almost like showy performance. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I thought yeah, he was I, fine. I just felt like he was awkward. Like man, he was, was he awkward. awkward? That scene at the yeah, bar. Yeah, there was definitely. Oh, oh, the cringe factor. Oh the my cringe, god, dude. that was so bad. That made me <laughs> embarrassed. So... I felt so much secondhand embarrassment during that scene. I had to look away. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so uncomfortable. I don't know. I I just didn't feel any emotion at all, so I guess I didn't cringe at that at all either. I was just like Dude, blank to not? the whole it's movie. Anytime, anytime somebody asks like if they can kiss somebody, I cringe. Like, don't ask, just do it. <laughs> yeah, just do it, and then it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, right? Like Michael Scott said, exactly. Wayne Gretzky said, "You miss hundred percent of shots you don't take, so just take that shot." Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I really don't have much else to say. I know this is a super short review, but if you guys watch this movie, you will know exactly why. There's why like nothing that happens. <laughs> like I know. Um, I do want to kind of um talk about the one part I was talking about. So I guess um, spoilers. Small spoilers here on. Okay. Just, I just want to delve in a tiny bit. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. But when she she ended up dying from DVT deep vein thrombosis like Mm -hmm. no nothing no one cared no one cried no one like they didn't even they didn't do anything with it that she literally dies and she just like this dead body on the thing and i actually made a note of when he walked into the room his reaction he's like oh yeah (laughs) it was so bad that's all he said like oh i'm like he's like oh it's like do you want to wait here yeah why? This was your. Yeah. This was like his, like maternal figure. This was like, this was the only family that he really cared about, and she died, yeah. and it was like that was it. Like he didn't care, and like it I felt tr- like. He- I tried to give it some leeway and just say he was in shock, but it just didn't feel like the right reaction B- because it never hit him. Like okay, yeah, you can not later, have shock. Yeah, later, show happened. him, show him like. Yeah. Breaking down a little bit, show him, show the, the emotional loss he went through from losing like his only true family that he cared about. But no, there was nothing. It was so, so like stoic and just not <laughs> not what it should have been. I don't know. And this was also like classified as a comedy, and I didn't get like I there were supposed to be comedic elements, which I know it's not supposed to be like funny, funny, but it was meant to have comedic yeah, more like elements, quirky, and, funny. I don't know. I yeah, don't know. I agree with that. Um, oh, I don't know if Kyle, like I wanted huge... I wanted to ask you a question. If you if you yeah, knew yeah. why, why does Steven Soderbergh he he cinematography all his movies, but he um, always goes by Peter Walker? Oh, I I don't have a reason. I don't know why. Okay, I didn't I mean, know if you knew or not. Yeah, Probably. sometimes they just use different... or Peter Andrews. I'm sorry pseudonyms like um he did the same thing for logan lucky he did it was uh was it either the directing or the acting credit or something like that i think he used a pseudonym um 
I think it was like a female name though, because he wanted to give, I don't know, some kind of recognition or something to somebody else. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the what the story is there. If there's even more to it than that, but um, I I just as far as the the death scene from the whole other movie, you can I think it's fair to say that a huge emotional outpour or like a really big performance there kind of actually would have felt out of place. Yeah, and I agree that he should have shown some emotion, but like too much there would have. Well, yeah, been not over like, the top. Well, this is, yeah, yeah, something. Just it felt, yeah, like it felt fake. That was like the first time. Like he's just like, oh, I'm like, what was that? Yeah, that was the yeah, only, literally, that. like the only part. I'm like, that was bad, but I just t- tried to chalk it up to him being in shock. Yeah, um, not much else to say. Like I said, it does look really good. Um, it looks really good. Some good shots. There's some good framing shots too. Like, it's not you know as far for how much conver- most of the movie is conversational. They don't always just do the traditional bus shot of you know moving back and forth. There's some interesting frame shots, but um, yeah, the, I'm uh, thinking the kitchen scene that's kind of like behind the head. It's like right in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's like on the table, uh, almost the camera. A lot of the shots when it's uh, Diane Weist and uh, Candace Bergen playing board games, and they're pretty much just talking. But yeah, they do a lot of uh, different. Uh, basically, you can only do one eighty because the because re- the other half is the wall. A lot of shots from every angle instead yeah. of just the typical back and forth. You know, if anything, um, that's so what yeah, kept this like that. more interesting than it was, right? Because if this was also not filmed interestingly, I would have felt that boredom way early earlier on. Like that kept it at least somewhat more exciting. You just reminded me of what else I was going to say is that it, like I said before, Steven Soderbergh usually elevates uh, material. So imagine if this material was in the hands of somebody else, how bad this would be. Yeah, exactly. Like this would have been (laughs) shit. Yeah. Something really... Yeah, I uh, also read that he filmed this in a wheelchair. Don't know why. I don't know if that was where. Maybe he's just eccentric from. at this point. Like he just like does. Like, he was zo- it's like his next movie. He caught off one of his fingers for this scene. It's like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> this scene yeah, he like, filmed with a he filmed with a a nineteen nineties Nokia. Yeah, yeah. He did I know film he a movie like with an insane. iPhone. Though. Yeah, he filmed Unsane on an iPhone. Which you know is cool to see what it can do, and it's cool for budgetary uh, constraints and stuff like that. But like filming in a wheelchair, what it what did that add? Because did I think it was like those so- those shots that were were like tighter shots, but like from the angle that you were talking about, like mm, the, the low like angle. looking up at them was why he was yeah, in right. a wheelchair. And I also read that Meryl Streep got paid twenty five cents for this movie. Yeah. Uh. That's what she. No yeah, wonder she didn't try. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She did great. Yeah, I. I don't know I if this will get any awards actually. recognition, but at the same time, it's a terrible, terrible year. So she might actually get nominated and just add to her, uh, her record of. I mean, I thought she was far and wide the best character. I think so too. Or well, yeah. I don't know about character performance, but she just yeah she. It feels like she is that person. Like I liked her character. Like she Yeah. They yeah. like wanted to paint her as like this bad person, but the whole time she was just like from what I got was like she was just an action she was a very nice person. Um it's just like she was like painted as this negative person, I guess. I don't know. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, anything else you guys want to add on let them all talk? No. Well then how about you add a star rating out of five? So despite all the negative talk and the flaws we talked about, it was technically just so well done and like, again, elevated that for me, it it brought it up to a three. Yeah. I'm in the, I'm in the same boat. I felt like there was enough good parts of it to put it above average because like you said there was elevated 
elements and th- it, there wasn't anything bad like i wouldn't say there was any this movie had anything bad in it it just was it just didn't have a focus boring it didn't have didn't have that wow factor to like bring you bring you into it and want it to elevate to a, what it could yeah it had a lot more been. potential that it squandered yeah, so I, gave it a three I star. am close to that, but I I think it's the the just it's the it's the subpar material elevated to being a watchable average movie. I think it elevates it to average status. So it's those technical aspects and some other things that bring it to just be barely watchable and average. That like if somebody was a super fan of this type of movie or a super fan of Meryl Streep or a super fan of Soderbergh's mid-tier films, you know, they could get something more out of this. Whereas, I, I mean, I really don't think there is anything else. I don't think rewatching this, is, you're going to learn much more from it. Like, Yeah, I, they I do don't try know if to there's have like a any of rewatchability of this. They do try to have those couple of deep moments, all the stuff with, uh, you know, Bloodwin, Pew, and uh, the the crisis of uh, this is the last time we're gonna look at the the pure stars you know stuff like that it just didn't hit in a movie like this with everything around it you know right yeah I definitely agree okay I think that uh, wraps up let them all talk um, we only are doing that as our featured review so that brings us to what else we've been watching. I only have one other thing. What do you guys have? So I watched two other things, but I can't talk about them. So, so both I of have them you can't one, talk about. Well, I had I watched three total. Two I can't talk about. There's one I could talk about, okay. but it is something that you talked about last week. I watched oh, okay. my octopus teacher. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that real quick. Yeah. Oh, I was totally into it. This is so cool. <laughs> like. That what the octopus did and everything and that kind of bond that they had was amazing. Like, I think I could just say that premise alone and get people excited and convince people to watch it. And I already convinced my coworker to watch it. So (laughs) just by saying talking about the relationship. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of like a hybrid between like a nature doc and uh, I don't know what the other phrase would be called but like you know a very human story with a nature doc yeah and so it's not it was beautiful uh, oh yeah the dude in 4k those shots like of the kelp yeah. forest that was so awesome. cool and i mean i really liked all that was involved into it the i like really understood what you meant by it wasn't that profound like but i felt like he thought he was being very profound. And that was the yes, worst part exactly. for me. The guy was kind of corny. <laughs> and I don't know, just the way he talked and stuff, I don't know, sometimes he was a little off to me, but that was like the worst part. Like, yeah, yeah I, it wasn't I, profound. There I wasn't more to gain from it. And I, some of the things he brought into, like, that he, like, would say that sounded like he meant it to be very profound and big and it just wasn't to me and well the problem is like some of the the stuff he says some of the stuff he says is like um it relates to him on a personal level but he never gives us any insight into what the personal problem or or dilemma yes he just i was waiting this helped me yeah Yeah, exactly i was like like, waiting for him like okay when is he gonna connect this because even he comes to his conclusion at the end he's like i feel you know this means that this is this and that, and he's like going on, and I'm like, but why did you need that? Like, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He like, never gave more insight into why this was so important. Really, is the way I wanted it to be. It for him, yeah, he was just saying that, it's important because it is, versus like it's important because of this reason to me. Yeah, so you have the, you know, you have the nature side, you have his personal story, and then, like, at the end, you kind of have this um, more, like, uh, planetary, like, conservation thing, like, we need to save the planet, which is all true, and that's good, but, uh, like, the the feeling, the emotion really is driven by these personal reasons, which we just never 
discover and you just have to be you kind of have to inherently be an animal lover to really feel like a lot of emotion from it because what you watch sometimes is a little i guess horrifying if you yeah it may it was to me like oh my god when i saw like like when he was talking about not wanting to you know fight i would have been like and they're like defending you know like i want to be able to sit back i'm like i want to protect her she's so beautiful yeah yeah so uh, all for those reasons yeah that's why that's pretty much why i where i landed uh i think yeah you're probably and i couldn't i yeah. completely agreed with where you were at i'm like yep <laughs> beautiful music like you were saying phenomenal oh that music like, that music is so damn good and just what happens in it is insane to even watch it, it like a lot of even the like scientists and stuff who have studied this have never seen the kind of things that he saw because of this relationship, this bond he made with this animal. And like that stuff was so interesting, but yeah, the, it was a little lost on where it wanted to be in the end. And plus mm-hmm. the guy himself, I just couldn't like empathize with him or sympathize with him as much because I just didn't know what he was going through. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, okay, so the only thing I watched was also a doc. Uh, this has been on my list for a while, and I finally just got around to watching it. I thought it would be a good plane watch, so I downloaded it to watch on the plane. Uh, and that is The Social Dilemma. So, Yeah, it's been on my Dilemma list, too. was kind of marketed as this hybrid doc between half narrative, half documentary. So I was interested from that alone. And then a lot of people were saying, oh, you have to watch it. Um, just because of the subject matter. And I have a lot to say on this documentary. I have two pages of notes, actually. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through them, and if I get too tangent or whatever, just stop me and let me know. Um, yeah. The main thing with this is uh, I feel like the main criticism for this doc is that it is uh, being too preachy. But I want to start off by saying I don't feel like it was it was too preachy, and I don't think it took that strong of a stance. Basically, what this the, what it's saying is that it's just I feel like it's more than anything just educating you on what social media is actually doing. Like this is scientifically data driven results, right? Like we know this mm-hmm. for a fact. This isn't this isn't saying I think social media is bad. I think you should not give your kids a cell phone. It's saying suicide rates are up, political divide is up, uh, collusion is up, election, you know, all these things are being interfered with. Uh, all of these things are a problem, and it's directly linked to social media. So there's no, like, debate here. It's just presenting you with information. If you don't like that, then you can probably make your own opinion and say, I think it's being too preachy. But I really think it's just giving you the information, and some people will take it good bad or you know whatever um so that's kind of what the documentary is about um now the people that are featured in it are all like ex heads or ceos or presidents of these different social media companies so this is coming straight from the source and all of these people have been turned into advocates for basically humane technology like Yes, they understand that technology is important and they think it's so important that we need it still, but there has to be a humane, regulated way of the public using it. Otherwise, it's things like 2020. QAnon. What we're seeing would happen. Um, Yeah, QAnon, exactly. Um, But I actually had something like that was a question I wonder is answered by this because... Okay, I feel like this is less almost talking about, again, I haven't watched this, but like less talking about gen, our maybe young millennials slash Gen Z and more about the danger it causes for like the baby boomers because, and maybe late millennials, I don't know. But, well, it doesn't really focus on age, but it does, it does do two different things. It, um, the first half is very much, uh, it's kind of like a build up, right? So the first half is saying it's a lot of information that we would already know, like just informed 
adults informed yeah. uh, our, our generation would already know this stuff right we know suicide rates are up and stuff like that but it's still important information like if somebody didn't know anything about it then it's like a good introduction so the first half is kind of almost boring or it kind of feels like it's talking uh, not down to you but there's some interesting tidbits and um the dramatization stuff is really the stuff that like I didn't like and there's not a lot of it which is good um but yeah they do they really focus on technology and kids how they use your information and how you're basically just a product because the there's a saying that says if something is free then you are the product being sold right? yeah nothing is ever which, free like, again is like giving it to you something for free, that I feel like a lot of people know Yes, right, for sure. Yeah, like you know that. But then they do kind of present it in a way that really stands out like, yeah, you know that, but do you know it to what effect? Like to what's what's the ends like mean? The actual like there data. is none. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like they go into that. And then the third thing is really uh more like politically driven, which that was kind of almost which the whole was second huge, half and yeah. that was the most interesting thing. Um so they actually did a study too of like the political divide in the country. We at like right wing and left wing actually used to be almost not not center, but like we used to see more eye to eye on things, and it's been spreading far apart ever since the introduction of social media. That's like the key factor. And no, I, it's just crazy. I actually like, do have a question about that because like if you look back, we just watched the the movie Trial of the Chicago what seven, seven. seven. <laughs> yeah, and. I mean, that divide must have been huge, too, like between the hippies and everyone on the way on the left, arguably further than we are as a whole. If you're on the left versus like and then the right was like also super far right. I mean, that's why like Nixon won. Right. So. Right. Well, that's OK. So that's like that was the 60s and 70s, late 60s. So that was, you know seven decades ago they don't cross that much time but i feel like it was divided or probably especially around civil rights period and then afterwards let's say the late 80s 90s i mean that was when i feel like we were probably closest uh to being center and then right after that um when once social media started coming around and information, false information. They do a ton of stuff on, you know, misleading information and how that's, that's become basically just a plague. Uh, and it's all through social media, right? They don't care about, they don't care about sending out misleading information. Like none of these companies care about what they are doing to people because they, they actually can't do anything to hurt themselves. Otherwise they'll get sued for decreasing stock value. That's what's so effed up is like, even though these people might have a conscience, they legally can't do anything because they'll get sued. So yeah, that's what, that was one thing that really stood out. Well, I mean, you can take a look at that, like currently. So you have the fact checkers, right? Who were trying because before it was like last, last election cycle, right? Just anything that was posted was just allowed. So you had all these just, you know, like, Clinton runs a sex island or something and like clearly like not a true thing. Wait, he does it or she does it. (laughs) Yeah. And like that used to just roam free. And then, okay. So you had this one where they're like, okay, people are stupid and we'll just not do research on their own (laughs) boomers. And they'll just believe it. So let's do fact checking. And now you're stealing people's freedom. You're not allowing them to just post whatever you're turning into this, like big brother controlling everything that people read and only saying this is the truth. And, but how can we trust you guys? You're what if you're hiding the truth with, she does have a sex Island. They drink blood, baby's blood, you know? And so like, where is that line? Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, uh, it's something that, you know, it's not going to answer. This isn't going to answer every question. They actually end the doc I think very profoundly by they by asking them, you know, what's the answer? What do we do? And they just don't have an answer. I mean, there's no way to answer it. Um, so it's very, 
they ended in a, in a very good way. Uh, the only other thing that like really stood out was the thing about evolution um, was mm. because they compare. It's funny. You never think about, or I haven't thought about it. Maybe other people have. I've never thought about how we have, uh, how organic things uh, evolve versus technology. Right. So I think about like an organic being a human evolving over hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. And technology has, it, um, technology evolves year after year exponentially. Like doubles, yeah. So since the '60s, we have been evolving every year. Technology has evolved exponentially, and it's going to keep evolving exponentially to a point where, like, we can't keep up. Like, <laughs> the same brain, our brain is almost virtually the exact same as it was 100, 200 years ago, right? But technology has changed. I mean, I mean, in our life, tenfold, twenty, a millionfold. Like, yeah, I mean, AI. I feel like, like they kind of so go hand in hand, though, hand in hand, because like the more we learn, the more technology learns. Right, right. Yeah, we can learn, we can learn, but there is our there brains is are something the same. that's already no. There's a point they actually talk about this. There's a point that we have already crossed where technology has crossed the point of human weakness. When will it cross the point of human strength? And crossing the point of human weakness already means that it crossing the point of human strength is inevitable, right? Assume, like if, if people have an addiction to social media or something like that, they've already, that's going to take them over no matter what. Like you can't, once you cross the point of human weakness, there's no coming back. And we have, it's basically saying that as a society, we've kind of already crossed that point and without regulations but, of some kind, we're, we're pretty much screwed. But I have like a question for that. So we're, we're thinking about like even from our perspective as millennials, right? But okay, think about Gen Z, right? They're not using Facebook. They're not really using Instagram. What are what are they using? It's like TikTok. TikTok which, Snapchat. Which, I mean, TikTok is not really like that same level of like social media as like a Facebook though, right? Like... It's totally um, different. No. I don't know. I've I mean, never even know. posted really a comment it, so. or anything. Yeah, on TikTok. Yeah. Versus, because it's, it's hard like, to kids say. are it's not using Facebook. Is, I mean, yeah, it's constantly changing. But I mean, I think kids definitely are on Instagram like more than, not like not as much, but I think it's definitely there. Yeah, it's just like, but even Instagram isn't like. Uh, isn't like Facebook. Facebook has like these articles and stories and things that people like dive into. But I mean, Instagram is not that. I mean, these kids are getting information from somewhere because I mean, the, the, like a lot of young kids and misinformed kids will post stuff all the time. Like, like not just even things that go against my beliefs. I'm just saying like things that are factually false, (laughs) like you see from them and, I think it's just from the people the that like that they get influenced by. Yeah, like certain groups they'll they'll see follow somebody and then they just kind of dive into that. Like I feel like they're more influenced by personalities than like we were. You know? Yeah. Like did you ever base your personal beliefs on what somebody else did like from the internet? Hell no. That's what I'm saying is I think actually a lot of young kids are influenced in that way. I mean, they're called Instagram influencers. They're called influencers. Yeah, true. YouTubers for a reason. Like, yeah, I never base my opinion. I like when somebody I like agrees with my opinion, but I would never <laughs> yeah, of course. change my opinion just because they have a different one. Yeah. I would so, just be like, I would think about it, but... I wouldn't just switch. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, those were some of like the standout things. I think as a documentary, yes, it is very, very important um, to watch. Uh, I don't love how they portray all the information. Um, And artistically, it's not, you know, it's not one of those docs. It's not my octopus teacher. It's uh, it's very information heavy. But they still do mm. some interesting things like um, they talk about, you know, how a, a notification on your phone is like a shot of dopamine. And then when they and they would do like a, a super cut of somebody getting a notification and then it would be like 
Requiem for a Dream style needle going in the arm, your eye, your pupils dilating and just like uh, serotonin flowing through your blood or whatever. Uh, you know, they would do like a super cut of that, like just interesting, more artistic stuff like that. So it's it's better than average. Lots of information. I don't love the dramatization stuff. I definitely don't like this stupid avatar thing that they do. They do like a a thing where um, inside out style where like there's these three guys that all look the same and they're like in the kid's mind and they're like, mm. or they're in his phone, I should say. And they're like, what should we send him next? Let's send him, let's send him an ad yeah, for shoes. Yeah, that's a bit let's cheesy. This and this. Yeah. It's pretty cheesy. Um, but yeah, I still liked it more than I thought I would for a doc. So uh, I gave it a 3.5. Nice. And you got to also think in the um, future, yeah, maybe technology will help just f- bridge our gap with our strengths and weaknesses you know a la cyberpunk <laughs> where we just get like implants and stuff that make a that's like our evolution next is that technology just becomes we basically become cyborgs yeah there is um it's not even about uh physically or like i mean there is some mental aspect but it's more it's more about um the companies themselves and also what they are willing to do um, just moral ramifications, sociological, and even like the actual, the physical planet itself is dying because of how fast we're growing with technology yeah. and stuff like that. And, ho- and, you know, hopefully with more growth in technology, we'll get past that. We'll be able to move into sustainable, but we're still not there. So there's a lot of questions that it raises, doesn't answer all of them. And that's the point. The point is that we don't have an answer, so we need to figure it out. Um, yeah, but yeah, and I think that is something that's check it out. becoming more like seen. I mean, a lot of the big players, Facebook has been in the news a ton lately for uh, being sued, and the government really starting to crack down on these companies, which is like a good thing because they're getting out of control. Yeah, yeah the for DLJ sure. is Definitely. doing a lot right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely um, recommend it. Not not high art, but important information. Um, so we uh, we said that we might do that recommendation, uh, The Man Who Killed Hitler and then Bigfoot this week. We are unfortunately going to have to move it to next week, but that also is good news for everybody because uh, we're going to have a guest next week. Eric is going to join us back on the show. We're going to be talking Wonder Woman and The Man Who Killed Hitler and then Bigfoot. So going to be a big show next week. We will finally be together again. I will be back in the studio with the boys drinking the it's same like a beer. Month. <laughs> yep. This will on, be a month. Good yeah. quality be one mics. month. Yep. Um, so look forward for that. We'll have a big show next week. I know this is literally going to be under an hour, um, but, uh, you know, that's that's what you got to do sometimes. We could have had no episode. It could be, it could be that, you know. You know, also to put this caveat in there, just so people can understand, I will be editing this episode. It will be the first time that I'm editing because Kyle (laughs) takes on those reins usually and does all the hard work for us. So, yeah, it's good that it's shorter because I'm taking that. And yeah, yeah, don't don't expect it to be of the same quality that Kyle does, but I'm going to do my best. (laughs) No, I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be good. Um, so, yeah, look forward to that next week. Wonder Woman, uh, the man who killed Hitler, and then Bigfoot. And then um, I think we have the rest of our, our year planned out, so we'll talk about that next week. But uh, for now, if you have questions or comments, again, send them into Suds and Cinema Podcast at gmail.com. You can find myself on Letterboxd and Untapped at The KG Project. I'm on both of those as JSAL517. That's J S A L 517. And I'm on both those platforms as well at Josh underscore Saldana. All right. Thanks for listening. Cheers, guys. <laughs>